my first um, contact with the health or wellness was my parents. My first teacher, who was also my father, his name was Kanjur Mbache. The word Kanjur actually is in Tibetan, uh, it's the translated words teaching the Buddha. And uh, there's over 100 volumes. And my father read it many, many times over, I think, 30 or 40 times. Um, as a st studying it himself, and also uh, he transmitted that reading to many, many people. So that was my first, first teacher, and also uh, my first contact with, uh, with health, because he was also a Tibetan uh, doctor. And since I remember, I used to remember, uh, I remember many people coming to see him. Some of them were, uh, would just come, many, of course many of them were Tibetan, would just come because they wanted the company, and many of them would come because they were sick. He used to give them medicine. He used to actually pick the, uh, these medicinal plants and then try them and make them himself and he used to give it to the many of them. So, I know that uh, sometimes, like about two o'clock in the morning, people would come, sometimes I would hear the hoofs of a horse, and that somebody had come and wanted him to come and look after somebody, check somebody, give them some medicines. So, that was my first, how can I say, contact with uh, medicine, or health, or whatever it is that we can call it. Actually, uh, the Tibetan medicines, most of them are quite bitter. And But as I used to get given it as, as a child many, many times, I used to actually quite like it. So sometimes I used to open his the little medicine pouch and then pour a little bit in my hand and just take it. So that's uh, how I really uh, got to know the wellness part. But there's actually another aspect to wellness with my father, um, which is actually something um, that really touched me uh, retrospectively with my father and with my other teachers that really touched me when I think back was that um, they were, of course, um, all of these teachers, whether it was Kanyu Rinpoche or Dingu Jin Rinpoche, they were both um, very well versed, of course, in Buddhist philosophy, but also in um, Tibetan medicine. And um, so I remember once somebody came to see my father Actually, a few times. Where once it was this lady whose husband had passed away, and she was really, really sad, and she was crying and sobbing. And when she first came, my father talked to her, and it looked like he was almost in such pain. It was almost as if he was suffering more than her. And then she kept crying, 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 and then she was sitting there like that, crying, and then. Suddenly, my father had an apple on his table. He put it in her hand. And that, when she looked at it, it sort of cut the, uh, the flow of her sadness. And then she, she stopped crying. And then they were just conversing very naturally, and then she even started to laugh. So that's another aspect of wellness or health that really came, became apparent to me. Especially there was this person who had, uh, I think, been a monk before, 
And then, yeah, disrobed. And then this time this guy came to see my father again. He was, he was a very, very boisterous, loud person. And he used to come and talk to my father every time he came. He used to bring the gossip from town and then talk to him. And one day when he came to see my father, he sat there and he was crying. And my father asked him, what's wrong? He said that his wife had left him for somebody much younger. And he was so sad and crying. And my father just looked at him for a while and then told him, you know, this is what you've been training in. You've been listening to this all the time. Now this is time to apply. So then again, another aspect of wellness. Many of us, when we think, when we say, how are you? Or, I am well. Most of the time, it's associated with physical health, not very much with mental health. And even if it is associated with mental health, it's more whether we are uh, feeling disturbed or not. So, in that respect, when my teachers uh, used to teach us, they used to say that there's many kinds of, so many suffering that everyone goes through. For example, my father used to teach, and when Tingu Jinzirimji used to teach. At first, the first day was okay, but afterwards it used to get a bit boring. Because every day, on top of the subject that they were going to teach, they used to remind us that there are infinite sentient beings, not just you. You used to say there is as vast as you think the space may be, there's even you know, depending whatever you however you think the sky is so vast, the amount of sentient beings equal to that, if not more. And used to say, they used to say that every single sentient being wants to be happy. There's no one who doesn't want to suffer. But no, none of us have the freedom to not suffer when we don't want. Nobody goes for suffering. Suffering just Arises. When it arises, then none of us are equipped to relate to it. And then they used to say, there's a few types of, few ways to categorize suffering. Some kind of suffering that all of us call suffering. Even a cat or a dog would call that suffering. If they are being hit, if they are hungry, that kind of suffering is common to all of us that we can all call suffering. But there's other kind of ailments that many of us are going through. Many of us, many, many, many people think that um, obtaining a lot of material things will save us from suffering. Of course, a minimum of how can we say, material things is necessary for all of us. It's helpful, but that can't completely uh, get rid of suffering. But that's actually you know, what we all experience now with this world, with all its technological advances even in the most uh, affluent places. If you look in the medical ca medicine cabinet, there's as many uh, medicines like Prozac or whatnot, which proves that actually there's different kinds of suffering. And that suffering, I was told by my teachers, is called suffering 
because of change, because of we do not know how to relate to change. Change is inevitable, but we don't know how to relate to it. We do everything to try to uh, freeze things, fix things, to be fixed so that they don't. But that's something we can't change. And you, they used to say that that's something, that's a suffering that you can't buy with material. He used to say that everything will change. Everything that you have, everyone that you have, even, even yourself will change. And that suffering, we usually don't think of it as suffering. We try our best to ignore that. Of course, in the Buddhist vocabulary, we call it impermanence. So, not being able to relate to that is another kind of suffering. And, of course, there's many, there are other uh, ways of uh, defining ailments or suffering. So, the, as my, these teachers used to always say that every day at the beginning, they used to keep reminding us of that, to the point sometimes I used to just switch off in the beginning, because I know they're going to say this thing, same thing, and then I used to wait for the actual, uh, what can you say, the subject of the day. And then, uh, but then, later on, I really understood why they kept repeating the same thing every time in the beginning of it. Because I think, without that repetition, I wouldn't really be able to remember it, I wouldn't be able to relate to it properly. I suppose it's the same as how our parents, when we're young, keep reminding us that they care for us. They say it over and over again. <laughs> but it's when we need it that we can actually really benefit from it when they keep saying it to us over and over again, like many children, some, some children, some parents even have told me that at a certain age, uh, these children are almost ashamed of having their parents go to school with them, etc. So I suppose, you know, many of us don't appreciate that aspect. So the idea of wellness here, when I remember my teachers uh, saying, repeating over and over these, the subject of what suffering is, that so many people are suffering, so many sentient beings are suffering, then in response to that, then what can I do? I myself don't know how to relate to change. When it actually happens, change is something that's inevitable. Then how do I relate to it? Now, in order to relate to that, popping pills doesn't help. If I keep popping pills, one day I'll just simply be somebody who, uh, I suppose, eats more pills than food. Then I suppose I can end up being more of a zombie than anything else. Now for that, then, I was told by my teachers that we need to, to know that in order to be well, in order to be healthy, we need to also conceive of the health of the mind, the mental health. And mental health, well, that requires some 
some time to contemplate, to think. So, I suppose, from a certain point of view, being in a place that is quiet, in a place where there's not a constant, how can we say, bombardment of our senses, it naturally makes us aware of our mind, of our thinking, and aware of what's happening in our mind, which most of the time I think we're trying to not be aware of, whether it is through the books that we carry, or whether it's through the mobile phones, Whatever it is, our world is sort of, has been catered to not thinking, not feeling what our mind is conscious of, making it not possible to think. For example, when we go to a doctor's clinic, Usually, it's filled with magazines. And these days, you know, there's a magazine there, we have to open it, and then also on top of it, we need our mobile phones. All of that because we don't have time to think. It's not that we don't have time to think, but I think it has something to do with not daring to be with one's own mind. The most fundamental thing for us as somebody who's, who has a consciousness, but at the same time, we do our best to not um, cater to it. So from that point of view, I think Vata is the ideal place, because somehow the trees, the leaves, can't quite distract us like a mobile phone, nor a magazine, nor a television, nor any of those things. So from that point of view, I think the quietness, the calmness, and even the word forest, I think is very, very conducive to, first of all, for us to know that we have a mind, that we have a consciousness, and that this consciousness is not something that absolutely needs to be drip-fed with entertainment, distractions. So, I think my perception of Vardhan is that it really um, provides this environment for, for us to appreciate the beginning of mental health, the health for our mind. But of course, this is not something we can force on anyone. So, I think the environment really provides that. I think Vana's purpose will be whatever every single person who comes here will make of it. I think that's really inevitable. It's going to be that. And I think for some people, that purpose might not be met the moment they're here, nor even right after they've left. It might be met many years afterwards. It can be met at any time. Usually when we think, what is the purpose of this? Like, you know, 
giving, let us say, giving a bicycle to a baby, it might sound like it's, you know, a bit silly. But should the baby grow, it'll be useful for them. So therefore, I think the purpose of it does not have to be in a, I can say, very conventional way. The purpose of it will really be what each of us can make of it. So, I think the first, uh, just the outer setting of the place, being right in the middle of this bustling, growing, how can we say, urban jungle. But at the same time, there is this, how can we say, rural, somewhat a rural haven. I think if one can notice that, I think that contrast is really, really uh, helpful. Of course, if we notice it. For example, when we're in town, when we go to Dyrudun and drive up from there, there's so much noise, you almost don't hear anything. Then you come here, it's so silent that it's almost too, how can we say, loud. I think something like that, something, if it can sort of wake us to what what we can uh, develop into, what we can make ourselves develop into. I don't think that, I don't quite believe that each of us are destined to do something and that that's the only thing that we can do. I think that regardless of whatever we seem to be destined to, we have an important hand in that destiny, or whatever that word may be. I'm not sure that word destiny is something I understand properly, or rather that I um, adhere to properly. For example, somebody might come here and want simply to have a break from their busy life. But it doesn't have to be that. Because at first, it's just not hearing cars, the diesel engines, or the constant, uh, how can we say, the cacophony of the horns, scooters. But then, if it can actually awaken us, not just <clears throat> to this outer calm, but more of an inner calm, calmness. For example, my teachers used to tell, tell us when they were teaching us to train our mind to meditate. They used to give us the example of the sky and the clouds, or sometimes the ocean and the waves, the mountain and the trees in the mountain. At first, the example of the clouds and the sky was given. I didn't really understand very much. Of course, I could understand what they were saying, but I didn't really realize the actual example of it. But later on, I found it really helpful 
used to, they used to say that our mind, its um, nature is like the space, like the sky, but that our stressful mind, our uh, strong emotions were like the clouds, like weather. When you look at that, you know, when we usually think of uh, mental health, training the mind, usually we think of it as, in the same way as we think of material things. Okay, you buy this and now you use it. You've got a pill, you pop it, and then that's it. But the mind is not quite like that. It's like the weather. I find a, found that example very helpful in that when they told me that my emotions were like the weather, like the clouds. Once I remember with my father, because I didn't, didn't used to go out very much, and sometimes I used to really plead with my parents to take me to town. And <clears throat> I used to promise that I would not complain because before I, I think a few times I went and I used to complain I was getting tired and then they said that they didn't want to carry me so I promised that I would not so one day they said okay next week we're going to go out and then just on that day which was supposed to be which of course I was hoping would be a nice sunny day it rained really torrential rain, like it happens in Darjeeling. I was really annoyed. But of course, as it's the weather, I can't do much. So what do I do? There's not much. And my father also you know, used to say, the same, there's two options, umbrella or wait. So we all decided to wait. I really didn't want to, but we had to wait. But that was quite an important teaching for me because when he said later on that our emotions are like clouds. You know, when I was sitting there looking at the clouds covering the sun, I was so annoyed. But I can't complain. I can't blame anyone. Nor my father, nor my mother, nor my brothers, or anyone for the clouds being there. Similarly, when my emotions arise in my mind, there's not much I can do. It's there. That's it. So, when the clouds came out, I just had to deal with it. That's about it. Deal with it in what way? I can deal with it by being angry. I can deal with it by being frustrated. I can deal with it by thinking, because the weather is not good, I'm not going to study. Because the weather is not good, I'm not going to eat. But none of that works. Similarly, when these emotions that really disturb us arises, there's not much one can do. Apart from the fact that these just change. Emotions, clouds, rain, none of that is permanent. It changes, and it changes every second. So, from a certain point of view, when my father and my teachers taught, told us that our emotions are just like the weather, like clouds, our emotions are not us, and they change. They change every day, every second. One moment I may be really happy, the next moment I'm really upset. Moment I see somebody I like, the next moment I see somebody I like but I'm afraid of. So these are all things that change. And that was really important part of understanding inner wellness. Similarly, when we are here, in this place, 
how we relate to it. I think for somebody who is just here for the first time, who has no idea of uh, not being, what is it called, online or connected, it may be really un upsetting, it may be really difficult. But at that time, we're experiencing inner clouds, inner weather changes. Of course, we can be like some people who say that climate change is uh, what it's called, is nonsense. Or we can start to really think, contemplate, and then begin a different kind of wellness. Okay, what else can I say? 